I'm live already. We're live now. Yeah. Maybe we can fix this a little bit. Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome to a weird room in my studio. Um, I'm assuming they can hear me. <sighs> can everybody hear me? Give me like, uh, say yes if you can hear my audio. Okay. Oh, are you picking them on there? Yep. Oh, very nice. We're picking, uh, going to try and find ourselves Andrew Hartley, AJ Hartley, to uh, to do this Tell me little Tell me interview me. with us. Um, give us a second to find him. I hope everyone's doing great. I figure I should just talk right now. I can't actually see the screen because we have an expert off to the side here trying to make this thing work. He's on. He's on. Is he on? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Where are you, AJ? That's fine. Should be there. We just got to find him within. There he is. Oh, look at that. Unable to join. Unable to join. Maybe he's got a, AJ, if you're watching this, I think you need to maybe click off, go away from the site, then come back again. Because for some reason it says unable to join and we don't know why. We just don't have the, the technology down here to know why you can't join. Um, yeah. This is actually a room that's right next to my studio. Um that we edit in. So there's like an editing bay right over here. I have a couch right here. We got a bathroom over there. We got a kitchen and a bathroom next to the other. Yeah. And we got um, a cat that wanders over here sometimes. And when you look at the tag, it's like, hi, leave me alone. I live in the streets or something like that. It's like a free range. Have you seen those free range cats? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so what are we doing now? Same thing, are we still gonna try and he still says unable to join. Why does it say unable to join? So we are still going to try and click on AJ here. This is a new uh, system for us. Uh, it's called Instagram. <laughs> and it's uh, a really great tool to post pictures. Got there him. he is. Okay, now we can. Look at this. I actually did this not a couple weeks ago where I just started getting random fans on there. Oh my, look at you. you handsome, you got all his hair and just like. Yeah. It's the pen. pen. How are you? I am okay. How are you? Sorry about the delay. Welcome to the domain of, uh, of all the different fans. I've been doing these every day, by the way, for radio stations and stuff. How I do all my It's kind of weird like around to different Instagram live accounts to do interview. I've been doing it for weeks. Uh, no more germs passing back and forth, you know? So are you six feet away from me? You're muted by the way. You're both, there you are. Now I just heard you. Okay. Barely. All right, we're gonna figure it out somehow. But in any case, but you can hear me good. Okay. Um, you know what I think we should do is we are on line. I think we should just not be online. It might be better. Uh, is this AT&T? Uh, Verizon. It's a Verizon. Verizon usually has the best there. Okay, can you hear me, AJ? Yeah, it's so weird when he talks, I don't hear his voice coming through. It's so, it's like broken. Um, but I'm loud and clear to you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There you go. Well, we'll try this anyways. Well, obviously today we are talking about this bad boy, which is near and dear to my heart. So I want to let everyone know when I first met AJ, we were discussing um, secret machines and we were digging into that for months and months. And he started a project um, before it was named cathedrals of glass and I loved it and I it's kind of like for me my interpretation of it was it was kind of a Stanley Kubrick or Hitchcock kind of thriller um, that was very it seemed like in my head I visualized it as this really modern story um, on this barren ice world these these mountains of glass but the paranormal aspect to it and dealing with consciousness and all that really made it interesting to me. I always thought that it reminded me of like when I saw Ex Machina, that movie where it's really like creepy, but cool, but modern and stylish, you know? So uh, the first question I have is, you know, where did the 
Like, where did it come from from you? Like, when you, when you made it up, you know, uh, were you meditating up in Tibet somewhere and it just kind of came to you or what did you do? Uh, no, I think um, I'd been in uh, Iceland recently um, and there was something about that landscape. And also I'd been skiing in Canada and such. And so I was fascinated by the idea of, of you know, when you're not used to that kind of environment, you're not used to those, those temperatures, um, the way that that changes the, the way you perceive yourself and everything around you. And, um, and I was, you know, fascinated by movies like Alien and, stuff, and those kind of stories growing up where, you know, you put in a situation where you have no idea what's going on. And so the fusion of those two things, I think, was part of the impulse for, um, for where it came out. And I wanted it to be a, as you said, it's kind of a hybrid, right? There's um, the, the it, it's a suspense story. It's a sort of psychological suspense, but it's also sci-fi and kind of horror as well. And I wanted to play with that idea of, a really small cast of characters in a closed space, in a, in a tight environment, in a very hostile place where nothing is what it seems to be. You know, it's funny too, because when you look at these barren places, uh, even on the earth, I remember we had all these rules for like how life could exist somewhere. And I remember at one point they were in the Arctic and they had like this lake of methane and then they found life in, the, in liquid methane. And they were like, oh, well, I guess life can exist in some place barren like this. And that's what was kind of cool about the story was you created the framework for a different type of life um, that existed on this planet. So I think, you know, for people that are watching this, what would be kind of the, 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 the cliff note version of what the whole franchise cathedrals is about? The premise of the story is that we're living in some sort of future alternate planet uh, where the where the culture is really technologically really connected uh, everybody all their relationships everything is mediated by something kind of like an internet right um and so and, and one of the consequences of that has been that people stop trusting uh in-person relationships that they're entirely reliant on the computer system for information but also not but for entertainment but also for the sort of basic way that they relate to each other. And I wanted to take people from that world and then remove that technological element and create a kind of a shock to their system where they had to become regular people again, physical people, flesh and blood people who were in the same space as each other and the way that they would find that, that difficult and stressful and embarrassing and then complicate it further by saying there's something about this planet, right? The idea is that these, there are these 10 kids, they're supposed to be going to be re-educated because they are in some ways deviant. They're on this ship, it goes off course, and they crash land on this planet that's supposed to be deserted, but in some key way isn't. And one of the things that happens is that they, they wake up with none of the technology working and all in this really confined space and then they start to discover a kind of psychic connection. So all the things that they would normally keep completely private are suddenly public in ways that they don't understand. And, uh, you know, I, I, um, and, and then the course of the story, they start to discover that many of the things that they've been told about this planet, about their own background on their planet, about their own history is wrong because they've been so dependent on a single informational source that it has been are we about the United States right now and UFOs, or are we talking about your book? Because I figure they're both the same thing at this point. Uh, there's a lot of overlap, and it's, it's been interesting because obviously I couldn't have anticipated it. But I think the pandemic has, in some ways, made the books feel a bit more urgent because we're in these sort of, we, as you were saying before, we're in the situation where we're sort of oddly separated and confined and dependent on this kind of technology for all our relationships and information. And it can be a little alarming sometimes when you start to see some of the things that are being shared as, as news or information that we think are suspect. Yeah, you know, and I think, um, I wonder if I should, you know one thing I was thinking we could do? I was going to, uh, maybe I can go on my, 
see, I'm on a different phone here. And I thought maybe if I go on my own Instagram and let people know that I'm doing this uh, as well. So I'm going to tell them right now. So I hit this. So watch. This is going to be like double, double live experience. Let's see here. Oh, wait. Do I have to turn this around? I want everyone to know that we're – okay, here we go. Um, okay, people. So for everybody watching, and there's only – I'm going to do this. This is going to – maybe we can do both here. Uh, oh, I guess you can flip it around, huh? So I'm going to flip that around. You can go like that. Now people um, – wow. Well, is this angle good? Good job. It's a good – okay. So now we got double Instagrams going. Um, and so well, people watching here already know it. People watching over there, I'm talking to AJ Hartley. So if you go to to the stars, put out with him, all cathedrals of glass. When when I um was first exposed to the cathedrals, what I really loved about it, when I tell people, they go, "Well, what's it about?" I go, "Well, you know, picture this this desolate planet that's brutal and cold and bare, but there's these." rocks made of glass so it definitely feels you know quote unquote alien but i but i said you know but then mix in a little bit of lord of the flies and mix in a little bit of like i said the hitchcock kind of kubrick stuff where you know the paranormal and i mean that in the sense of what's more than natural supernatural so stuff we don't understand uh, not necessarily something that's magical it's just stuff we don't understand imagine that creeping its way in to the that are there and how that would affect um, people that are so used to technology and so used to a perfect home and so used to like you know being robotic in their daily lives and also now they're here and the individual is is so important it's like uh, it, and then you don't even really trust anyone because everyone's now unique versus the whole would that be appropriate to, to paint it that way yeah, I think that the Lord of the Flies example is a really good one because I think that was very much in my mind that that idea of putting people in a situation where none of the usual rules apply, where all their notions of civilization and, you know, uh, social mores, whatever you want to call it, the way people deal with each other is all kind of out the window. And what happens then? How do people, you know, what versions of themselves come to the fore? when there's nobody watching, when the, none of the usual um, uh, codes of, of behavior are relevant anymore, right? Because they're not in the super sophisticated towns where they grew up. They're now on this desolate, isolated, uh, frozen planet. And back to the people over here on my Instagram, if you want to see this in real time, just go over to the To The Stars Instagram feed. Is it just To The Stars? Media. To the stars media. You can watch it and see AJ as well as we talk about his books, Cathedrals of Glass. It would be a little bit easier because you probably can't hear him that well, so do it. All right. So people are asking here, and I have some questions from 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 fans, but but even before I get to that, um, the couple, like I guess the first thing is, uh, how does book one tie into book two? Like just top level, um, without giving away too many Easter eggs here. Um, so, you know, in book one, this group of 10 crash land on the, on this planet, um, and bad things happen. Some of those bad things are create are come out of their own sort of breakdown, their own turning on each other. And some of it comes from some kind of external, uh, paranormal presence. Um, they're also being hunted by the planet that they left in the first place, right? So I don't think it's giving too much away to say that at the end of book one, not all 10 are still there, right? right. They're still stuck on this planet um, and they are depleted. It's a smaller group now. And book two basically picks it up. A few months later, they've been, the survivors have still been there um, and trying to sort of figure out how to make this a home, a way that, a, a place that they can actually live in and survive in. Um, and book two becomes all about the possibility of escape. But in book one, you know, you started to get the sense that sometimes, as I said, things were not as they seem. In book two, that goes way, way up, you know, and the sense of a kind of being stuck in, in 
versions of a kind of technologically manipulated mind game where you don't know what's real and you're trying to figure it out because your survival depends on it. Uh, that's what book two is about. Trying Which to get I, off the planet. I love that. It. That's the best part about these stories. It's like, uh, you know, sometimes you have books that are like pure action or pure horror or, or whatever. Um, you set up these moments where everyone feels safe and then like something happens and it's just like, it, I remember in, the, in book one particularly, uh, there was one moment where just out of nowhere something happens and it was just blood and crazy. And I was just like, where did that come from? And I never forgot that image. We worked on some concept art together and I'm just wrapping our heads around everything. And that was like one of the scenes that I was really passionate about, like um, playing with. There was another one, and this won't give away anything in the story, but I remember one time they were sleeping and, and one person looks up and there's like an air conditioning type air vent and like these hands are crawling through the vent. It's just so creepy. It's so poltergeist, you know, and I, and, um, I just thought it was really, really cool. Um, fan questions here. Um, how have current events shaped your writing in 2020? And, or do you try to separate them? Uh, there's a lot going on right now that humanity will be taking, uh, talking about forever, things that tend to echo in various art forms. Now, I know that you have direct family um, that, that are not just pure white. You know, you're somebody that has very strong personal views about um, just race relations and all that. I mean, I, I know that you would have a lot to say about that. So with everything going on, like how does, how does that affect your world and like um just because it's so ne near and dear to your heart but at the same time you're supposed to be creating in these books and writing these new stories you've got to be affected by it because it's in your family absolutely i i think that's that's really true um yeah as you say my wife and son are not caucasian uh and the, you know my writing has often sort of touched on on issues of of race and i've kind of doubled down on that over the last few years when some of these concerns seem to be really under pressure. Um, I've always been sort of a political writer. Uh, sometimes that annoys people, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's what well, I got. It's well, um, so, so the story. <laughs> well, I remember, I mean, means, you, you were the one that brought up, I mean, this is years ago, you know, where you wanted to make sure that we had a diverse cast in there in uh, characters. And, um, and I just thought that was like so on point. I was like, God, you know, of course a professor would bring that up. You know, he's smart. <laughs> but I mean, you, you were, you were, you brought it up in a way that wasn't just like jumping on the bandwagon, you know? And I just thought that was really insightful of you. And, and it's cool to hear that's still on top of your mind. I mean, I think the difficulty obviously is that I'm still a white guy. So writing those kind of characters can get tricky. Uh, so I have, you know, a pretty wide selection of, of friends and family who are people of color who read the stuff to say, here's where you might be getting it wrong or here's where some, some concerns that you might want to think about. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, th those issues are, are, are central to the way that I, I think and um, uh, always likely to be, yeah. Yeah, cool. I mean, it sounds like you listen, which is all of us white guys need to do, you know, like something that's been we've very apparent over the, the handful of weeks is like, oh, my God, we don't listen enough. So that's awesome. Next question uh, is from Derek. I was thoroughly enjoying the book all the way to the end. My question would be, were there any endings? Not sure you can answer this as it would be a potential spoiler for those who haven't read it. Were there any things that you thought about getting into that would have been cool? Maybe you haven't done it yet or anything you could think of? Well, um. I think, you know, when I first wrote the book, I wrote it, I wrote the first book as a standalone. And it was only when you and I started talking about publishing these books together that we started considering making it a series. So in the first version, there was a clearer sense of closure at the end of book one. Um, and, uh, and it was just gonna end the story. And I think that, you know, when we started talking about book two, I actually originally had a very different idea for it. And the, the stuff that we were just talking about, about not being able to determine what's real and what's not, and exploring the kind of the mind games element of the situation, a lot of that came from you. I don't know if you remember this, but it was when we started. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you I don't think credit for your work. You know, like, you're really good at what you do. So uh, 
But if you want to throw it at me, that's great. But I just don't buy it either. You know, kids don't buy it's, it. But it's true. I think, you know, um, I was thinking of the second book originally in a more conventional action adventure kind of way with a very precise kind of conclusion to it. And, and we got talking about pushing those those concerns about what's real and what's not, when do we know? Um, and that completely changed the tenor of the book. So um, I, I like when I do a series, I like, uh, if it's three books, I like each book to be clearly connected so that it feels like you're telling a, a single large story. But I also like each book to have a slightly different feel so that it's not just more of the same. Sure. So I think while book one is very much about kind of, there is a more of an action adventure component to it. Book two, I think, becomes a bit more trippy, a bit more sort of psychologically in, unstable. Well, I could tell you in my conversations about this, um, which I just literally had on Thursday with more producers, because as you know, when I say I'm going to do something, always going to do it. It just takes a while. But I always have big plans for what cathedrals could be. It just takes takes a minute. The Hollywood has really weird, as you know, I mean, you're, you're in the middle of a bunch of stuff uh, with television and features right now. But in any case, as you know, it just takes time, you know, and all of a sudden a book is discovered and it's been out for a while. But um, I, I had lately, I've had a lot of um, production houses. Uh, I've had a lot actually since we've lost launched to the stars, but they're calling up like, what do you got? You know, you, you guys are doing is so cool. And, um, and so I had this conversation about cathedrals, literally just a few days ago um, in terms of, uh, you know, writers and directors and, and kind of, you know, what it's all about and, and how do we see it. And I think the coolest thing is what you just said. Like what I saw in it was this is a, it's a story about um, something that it's funny. It's kind of like the pandemic. It's like something that's invisible and creepy and you can't guard against it the way you think you can. And every time you think you understand it, it's different. And that's what I think is really great about this series. So I, it was, I thought, you know, I, I noticed it right away. And it's funny too, because you did the same thing with Secret Machines. Like you say, I did this to you on the book and how you changed some of your views on book two, but you did that to me on Secret Machines. Like when we, when we did Secret Machines, I was thinking that this is the story and this is how it's done. And you came back with, you know, four or five different people living out their life, but they intersect um, and then they intersect quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker towards the end, you know, and um, the way you did that was like just fucking magical it, and it resonated and it, it put an actual framework to a lot of disparate parts. And so I, 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 uh, I was very enlightened at that moment too. Sometimes it takes somebody outside your own box to go, oh, I really like that color. And you're like, oh, I didn't even know I was painting in that color. So. Um, another question from Jenna. Um, AJ, so much of your work is based on the stories of strong female characters. True. Uh, what inspires you to create such characters? And also, thank you. As a woman, it's much appreciated. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Um, I, I mean, I, I've always done it. You know, my first novel back, when, not, not the first novel I wrote, the first novel I published, what, 16 years ago, um, had a female lead. Um, I don't know. Uh, I always I like writing that pushes me outside myself. You know, I think that writing is always an exercise in empathy and imagining yourself in another situation. And sometimes it's helpful to get out of your own head and to sort of think, you know, what would this person who is not me do in this situation? Um, and I, I think, you know, it's good to sort of destabilize the notion that the, the the generic protagonist is straight white male, you know, because that's what we grew up with. And, um, and I think it's good for everybody to read stories that are a little different from that. I, I, I must say that usually when I write women, I don't think this is somebody completely different from me. I determine, I say they're female. And then most of the time I try not to worry too much about the, the gender, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've read, writing by guys writing as women which doesn't work because they're constantly you know talking about their breasts and stuff yeah i was gonna say like I, if i wrote a, a character like a strong female character i'd probably write 50 shades of gray you know and i would be like okay this is what i think all women are like 
and this is really getting to the heart of the species. But that's just me, you know. But I will say, uh, you know, we were working on a song the other day and um, for the New Angels record, and th for some reason, it um, it did change a bit. Okay? But the first thing that hit me was uh, the point of view of a single mother going through um, raising a child that really doesn't have the money, the resources, the help. Uh, in a world that's pretty harsh, you know, when you're in that position. And I remember just getting all these feelings. I think artists do that a lot. I think we have an ability um, when we're at our best to be able to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes and immerse yourself. And I know from working with you, like you lock yourself up in your attic, you know, you shut the windows and the doors, no one can bug you. You don't even put on music. I don't think I remember I was, I was like, dude, put on some music. And they're like, no, you know, everyone's process is different. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, at our best, we can, we try to and, and get into somebody else's shoes. And it's hard of a writer, that's all you're doing. I mean, like, you have to, to understand what they would say, what they would do, how they would act. And, and, um, you know, I think it's, I think that's a, a lot of people can't do that. Maybe people that aren't, don't, aren't artists, that's, they, they don't necessarily have that. They might have a different superpower, but I think there's a basic, you know, sometimes there's that men are from Mars, women are from Venus bollocks, where it, it's like, you know, we treat them as completely, totally different kind of things. And, you know, I, I remember George R. R. Martin, the guy who wrote Game of Thrones, you know, and I heard him interviewed once and somebody said to him, you write strong, great, strong female roles. How do you do it? And he said, uh, I've always thought of women as people. That's it. I knew that. Wow. I never thought of that. You know, I was like, wow, that's really caught me off. Whatever works, he's obviously successful. What if he said something like, I've always thought of women as dragons? <laughs> you would think it'd be something like that. I don't know. Game of Thrones was crazy. We actually had a lot of discussions about that with Secret Machines, even because they had so much information into so many different lines. We used that as a, as a comparison. Um, which is interesting. Uh, great series of books. Not that I read those, but I did watch the show. Okay, next question. Um, from Kane. Cathedrals of Glass is centered around an Orwellian-like civilization where mankind ha has had their true history edited. Secret Machines is about covering a hidden past. Is there a theme going on here? Well, um, I think that, that larger point that I was saying before about that, that sometimes we don't know what's going on, right? That we're, we're trying to piece together pieces of evidence to figure out the truth of our existence. I think in a way that's always uh, at the heart of, of a novel, right? That is, at, at the center of a story is often um, a quest for some kind of insight into the world and who you are within it. And in that sense, I think, yeah. Um, is it more specific than that? Um, I think it varies. You know, I think that that we're pursuing similar kinds of concerns. And that's partly because of, you know, the interests of, of To The Stars, that you wouldn't have picked this series up if you didn't think that it fit with that sort of larger mission of, of the company, right? Um, of exploring these kind of things. And I, I think sometimes of a comment that Jim Semivan made once when we were having lunch or something, when he said that he, he thought that one of the problems with science fiction was that people always focused on the technology of the future and not on the way that humanity itself might change. Interesting. Damn it, Jim. Right? Doesn't he? <laughs> I think, so I think that's part of what we're doing in, in both, both series as well. Well, when I started To The Stars, I was after... Um, you know, it really came from me wanting to attack, you know, things that can change who we are and how we fit into this world and what we're supposed to do. I mean, the whole thing of what it's all about. So to me, it was like, you know, what's the true history of who we are? Is there life out there? What is consciousness? What is the soul? Um, are there multiple dimensions to existence? What are other planets like? Are, is physics different in different places? And you came, you know, uh, with cathedrals, you were very much touching on a bit of that, the soul and consciousness, um, what physics could be like or things that could be like on other planets. Uh, who are we 
if, if um, as human beings, even though we're in a technological society and then you, all those things are stripped from you. So it matches up perfectly well. And it was very stylistic, you know, like uh, the title and the imagery and, and being, I'm still one trillion percent after seeing this thing through uh, to film, because I just think it's going to be thick. So, um, and for everyone watching uh, the, the book, Cathedrals of Glass right here, over there to my Instagram, and then also up to you guys. Uh, both books are available at tothestars.media and uh, also everywhere else where they sell books. And uh, we will be bringing this out to the world uh, in some type of format. And I say it that way because obviously now it's just be like, let's make a movie, but it's like, oh my God, movies are on TV now. They just got movie theaters because of the pandemic and there's like no movies to play. <laughs> they've all switched to putting it on Netflix or whatever. So it's a really interesting landscape now for entertainment. But, um, but I, uh, I'm really excited to keep working with you. You and I have still lots to talk about some of the other projects we've been discussing. Um, you are a favorite writer and uh, we, uh, we have a lot more to do. So thank you for coming on and, and talking to everyone over here on my Instagram, everyone on Two stars Instagram, and uh, we will catch up more later. Sound good? Thanks. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Oh, I hit the wrong button.